Hey fellow studiers, welcome again to this week's Torah Parsha called Yitro. Jethro as we know, but Yitro. And we're going to be studying this week. Thank you for joining again. Um, so glad that you could join. I don't like studying alone, so let's get into it. All right, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. Jethro, priest of Midian. Moses' father-in-law heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, God's people, and how Hashem had brought Israel out from Egypt. So we I have a note here. This this note is incredible. Um <clears throat> let's see, it's in the Hainu. I'm gonna see if it's in our let's see, Rashi, do you have it? And Jethro heard. Um Real quick, um, just to show you, there's a word here, Kohen, Yitro, Kohen, and I just want to show you that he is, um, see here how it's a priest, priest, da, 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 high priest. Also, oh, they don't have it here. Another term for it is uh, like a, a ruler. Oh, it has it, principal officer or ruler. It's under the first, there, the first definition. Okay, so Jethro, Peace of Midian, I'm reading the verse. Moses' father-in-law heard all that God had done for Moses. He heard all that God had done. So let's focus on what the what Rashi is saying about and Jethro heard. What was the particular report which he heard so that he came? The report was the division of the Red Sea and the war with Amalek. When it says he heard, and it says Rashi is saying, um, he heard and he wanted to come to Moshe to understand what's going on here. So, um, and then I want you guys to pay attention to a, a note right after that one. Um, it says Jethro and it goes into all the names. Remember we saw the name, uh, Reuel, um, Putiel. We saw all these names, Jether, Jethro, Heber, Kenny, Kini. I'm not sure how to say that. Um, please check out all these different, um, names and what they all mean very important and it says he has seven names that can't be a coincidence that he has seven not six not five okay let's keep it moving <clears throat> so he had heard all that god had done for moses and uh for israel not just moses but israel and it's identified as god's people and how Hashem had brought Israel out from Egypt. So now he is working with the name here. So verse two, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after she had been sent home. What does this mean after she had been sent home? Wasn't she with him? Didn't she go on the donkey and the, the, the angel came? Um, when, let's see, having, after having sent her away. So after she had been sent home, Rashi has a note here. When God said to him in Midian, go return to Egypt, and Moses took his wife and his sons, and etc. And Aaron went forth towards him and met him at the Mount of God. He, Aaron, said to him, who are these? And Moses answered him, this is my wife, whom I married in Midian, and these are my children. He thereupon asked him, well, where are you taking them? And Moses replied, Egypt. Whereupon he said to him, we have cause to grieve over the former ones, meaning the Israelites already there. And you propose to add to their number? So Moses therefore said to his wife, return to your father's house. She took her two sons and went away. So that's from the Mechilta, as we've been reading steadily from there, of Rabbi Yishmael. So this is uh, what the, the oral tradition, the oral law has um, said about uh, why this line says, so Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah and Moses' wife after she had been sent home. So it fills in the understanding of having been sent home. Wasn't she with him? Verse three, if you have any more insights, you know what to do. Please, it's a learning community. It's a sharing community. Help, help, help. Teach, teach, teach. When you want to learn, learn, learn. Okay. Um, and verse three, and her two sons of whom one was named Gershom. That is to say, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, meaning the God of my father's house was my help. What a beautiful name. Delivering me from the sword of Pharaoh. Um, it's such a beautiful name, the God of my father's house. What the God of my help, I would believe. Um, that is what that name, the God of the God was my help. 
and or the god of my father's house is my help okay <laughs> it's a beautiful name because we're used to sleepy hollow and all that <laughs> and it doesn't give a good light on that name okay verse five jethro hey if, any, if anybody's named eliezer please that modern times let let me know or anybody got a nephew or a son named eliezer let us know hey why not Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought Moses' sons and wife to him in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Moses, so Jethro goes to meet Moses at the mountain. And we're going to talk about why Jethro is going to meet Moshe or Moses at this mountain. Okay, verse 6. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to see you, bringing along your wife and her two sons. So verse 7, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed low and kissed him. Each asked after the other's welfare, and they went into the tent. Okay, Moses then recounted to his father-in-law. Listen, Jethro goes to meet, goes to meet Moshe at this the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and he recounts everything that Hashem has done. Uh, and, and Jethro brings with him Keturah and, um, not Keturah. What's his wife's name? Zipporah. <laughs> Excuse me. Zipporah and the two sons. Okay. All right. So Moses then recounts, we're in verse eight, to his father-in-law, everything that Hashem had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. And all the hardships that had befallen them on their way and how Hashem had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced over all the kindness that Hashem had shown Israel when delivering them from the Egyptians. What an interesting statement here. Let's look at this. Okay, well, come on, Rashi, we got. Okay, this is its literal meaning. So it's. It, uh, Rashi's like, he rejoiced. He was happy. Uh, so there's a Midrashic comment. And remember, Midrash always, it's like a little explanation to give us more oomph about what's, um, what's being said here so we can really understand. So the Midrash, Midrashic comment is, his flesh became full of prickles. His flesh crept with horror. He felt grieved at the destruction of Egypt. Okay, this wasn't what I was thinking. That is what people say, what the common proverb says. A proselyte, even though his heathen descent dates from as far back as the 10th generation, do not speak slightingly of an Aramean or any non-Jew in his presence. I really don't know what that means. Um, so let's go to the next comment. Uh, if anybody has any insights on that, please put it in the comments. Share with us. The next comment is the goodness in giving the manna and the well of the Torah, and he rejoiced above all of these, more especially um, that he had delivered them out of the hand of Egypt. Until now, no slave had ever been able to escape from Egypt because that land was closely shut in on all sides. But these had gone forth 600,000 in number. We got that from the Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael. Okay, verse 10. Blessed be Hashem, Jethro said. Who delivered you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians uh, I just want to read a note that we have on uh, verse 8 it says Moshe recounted to his father-in-law everything Hashem had done um, and one of the notes here from the, that Rashi gets from the, the Mechilta is that he relates the story. There's a reason he's telling uh, his father-in-law everything that happened to him. It's in order to allure his heart that he might attach him to the Torah. And if anybody's familiar with it, um, us Gentiles, us non-Jews, we are supposed to learn from the Jewish people the Torah um, because they have the way to follow Hashem. So um, his telling this to his Gentile father-in-law on purpose in order to allure his heart that he, he might attach him to the Torah. So that's just really beautiful. Okay, I just wanted to re review that note. And it works. 
<laughs> so Hashem says, um, verse 11, now I know that Hashem is greater than all gods. Yes, by the result of their very schemes against the people. And this is a really, really interesting um, comment because if we go back to verse 10, back in the day, Egypt was the thing. It was the it was the powerhouse. So to be for to to defeat the Egyptians, first off, Jethro is a high minister or um, government official in his land, Midian. So he understands politics already. So to to know that the Egyptians are defeated by these people who have been enslaved, they were enslaved when Jethro came to his power, if you will. So he already understood the situation. So this is like huge. So he was like, now I know that Hashem is greater than all gods. Like, wow, this blows my mind. I just wanted to, you got to see this note. This is hilarious. So when he said, now I know that Hashem is greater than um, all gods, Mechilta uh, the Rabbi Yishmael says, I indeed know him formally, but now I know him even more. So that's really beautiful. But the next comment, check this out. He is greater than all gods. This tells us, this is again from Mechilta the Rabbi Yishmael, that he, uh, Jethro, had a full knowledge of every idol in the world, that he left no idol unworshipped by him. <laughs> so he knows that Hashem is the God of all gods because he worshipped them all. And that's some credentials. Okay. Uh, verse 12, and Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to partake of the meal before God with Moses' father-in-law. Uh, I just have a, a note here on verse 9. Let's see if we can find this here. Um, it's No, it's not here. But the, ver the note is about, for Yitro himself was a descendant of Mitzrayim, another way to say Egypt, the original way to say Egypt, excuse me. For he was a Midiani, and a Midian was a son of Keturah, who is Hagar. Wow, so uh, this is Mitzrayim, is how you say, uh, excuse me, Egypt in Hebrew. For Yitro was a descendant of Egypt. He comes from the son of Keturah, who um, the rabbis say is Hagar, the... Um, wife of um Abraham after he was a wife with when Sarah was there and then after Sarah died he married her they, they're sage to say so Yitro felt a certain degree of distress at hearing what happened to Egypt for they were his kith and kin so when we read that comment about the distress the say the whoever made that comment that is why they're saying that he was distressed because that's supposed to be where he comes from. But I want you to also to see, let me see. Do I have all the comments there? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, I want you to see this comment here. Um, so we get, so we have Yitro going to meet Moshe at Mount Sinai. Moshe tells him everything, leaves nothing out. He doesn't hold back from the telling what the God of Israel is doing. Then you see an interesting thing. After that, in verse 12, Yitro brings burnt offerings and sacrifices for God. Um, and Aaron comes with all the elders of Israel to partake in this meal before God with Moses' father-in-law. Why is it giving us all these details? Let's see. Okay. Oh, they just, okay. From the statement that says was before God, we may learn that one who takes part in more literally has enjoyment from a meal at which scholars sit may be regarded as though he has enjoyment from the splendor of the Shekinah. 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 All right. That's in Brachot 64a. Well, that's the end of the first reading. And we will go into our second reading. Okay, time for the second reading. We're in Exodus 18, verse 13. Uh, before we get going, I just want to read this note um, to help us out. There's a little summary from the Hainu, um, uh, which is uh, published by Chabad. It's a monthly subscription you can pay by the year. I'll put the link in the notes. So, 
In order to complete the story of Yitro, the Torah now jumps four months ahead to 11 Tishrei, the day after Moshe um, descends Mount Sinai for the last time. At first, Moshe tried to answer all the people's questions and settle their disputes himself. Yitro points out various shortcomings in this approach and suggests that Moshe sets up a hierarchy of judge, judges, reserving for himself only those cases that were too difficult for the judges of the lower courts. That's a summary of what we're getting ready to get into. But the whole point is now that the Torah is staying with Yitro and his narrative. So to do that, it jumps now. Now we're going to jump four months ahead. So where we are in the story is be, the reason Yitro is meeting with Moshe is because all these things that we know, the commandments, the, the um, uh, golden calf, all these things have happened. Moshe is at Mount Sinai. These things have already happened. So now he is, we're going to see Moshe sitting to judge the people. You need laws and statutes and hukim, because um, God said so, uh, statutes, um, rules, regulations, how to proceed. You need Torah in order to judge. You need something. So that's why we see Moshe sitting here judging, meaning all that with Mount Sinai has already happened. So now Moshe is doing his job leading the people. So let's look at verse four, excuse me, verse 13. The next day, Moses sat as magistrate among the people. While the people stood about Moses from morning until evening. Wow. But when Moses' father-in-law saw how much he had to do for the people, he said, what is this thing that you're doing with the people? Why do you act alone while all the people stand about you from morning until evening? And Moses replied to his father-in-law, it is because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes before me and I decide between one party and another and I make known the laws and teachings of God. God. So Moshe is saying, when they have a dispute, it comes before me. How is it that it comes? They, they've come to ask about God because they're receiving the Torah. Now the question is, how do we act this out? Like, how does, what does it look like? You know, if it just says, um, I don't know, don't steal or whatever. What does it mean? People, money? Like, what does it mean? <laughs> So you have Moshe um, giving an understanding of it. That understanding is where we get the oral law. All these disputes is what's put into the oral law. And from those, <clears throat> however the court, like how we do now, when a court case is um, goes to the Supreme Court or wherever your highest court is in your land, that founding, uh, that, excuse me, the um, the direction from that court case now becomes a law if you will and now everybody knows well since the court decided that way uh, this situation looks just like that and you know so that's how the oral law gets built up from all these questions and things and understanding of how to navigate with these laws that Hashem gave Hashem gave that right to the Jewish people to say okay um, Hashem said no work on Shabbat and we need to make this day look different from the other days and all that. And so we have to figure out how to do that. And that's where that oral law comes into play. How to do uh, how to do things in the way Hashem would like them to be done. He gave that right to decide how to walk those things out to Israel. I hope I'm saying that the right way. If I'm not, put it down in the comments. <laughs> Please. Because I'm still learning myself. But I think it's really cool. Okay. So uh, when they have a dispute, it comes before me. And I decide between one party and another. And then I make known. See, I make known once I made the decision. How the laws and the teachings of God. I make known the laws and the teachings of God. And that word is the huke, the hukim, the because God said so laws. And the torotah, what is it? Torotah, the torotah. His Torah, or the teachings of God. And verse 17, but Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing you're doing is not right. 
you will surely wear yourself out and these people as well for the task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. And I want to make a note, um, verses, um, when, uh, when Moshe says, when they have a dispute, verse 16, it's written differently in here. When any of them has a matter of law in the high it's written differently. When any of them has a matter of law, he comes to me and I judge between one man and his fellow and inform them of God's laws and teachings. I inform them. And I know here it says it make, I make known the laws, but the whole point is to give you information so now we know how this works. And that's what Moshe is doing. Um, okay, so Jethro's like, yeah, that's all fine and good, but you're going to wear yourself out. Um, this task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. Now listen to me. I'll give you counsel. And God be with you. You represent the people before God. You bring the disputes before God. Let me just click on here and see if we have. I will give thee counsel, but let God be with you. In considering this counsel. So, uh, Mechilta, the rabbi, Yishmael, Yishmael is saying, it's not that Yitro is saying, you don't listen to me, full stop. No, he's not saying that. He's saying, I'm going to give you counsel, but let God be with you in considering if what I'm saying is right. Let Hashem tell you if what I'm saying is right or wrong. And this is really what he said to him. Go and consult with the Almighty as regards to the counsel I give you. Beautiful. I just, I just had to do that note. Okay. You represent the people before God. You bring the disputes before God. And enjoin upon them the laws and the teachings and make known to them the way they are to go and the practices they are to follow. I love this. I'm going to read another translation of that. This is Yitro. This is his father-in-law. He was not at Mount Sinai. He, that means Moshe told him so good how the Torah works, the instructions, how the Hukim works, the statutes from God, how everything works. Because they're a nation. They have uh, uh, laws and God is their king. He told, Moshe told Jethro so good that now when Jethro gives him counsel, he gives him counsel in a form that matches what Moshe received. This is amazing to me. He says, so here's this translation <clears throat> in the Hainu. You shall warn them about the laws and teachings. Warn them. Be careful with these things. Now, you're going to inform them on the path that they will follow and the deeds, the works that they will do. Inform them, make them known how to do that, but warn them about the laws and the teachings. This is so that those really interesting um, comment there. Verse 21, you shall also seek out from among all the people, capable individuals who fear God, trustworthy ones who spurn ill-gotten gain, Set these over them and chiefs, as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. And I'm going to uh, pause right there. So here's this. So the council has started. Listen to me. I'll give you counsel. You, rep, you must know you represent the people in front of God, before God. You bring, number one. Number two, you bring the disputes before God because you represent the people before God. Number three. You're going to warn them about these laws and teachings. And number four, you're going to make known to them the way that they are to go and the practices they are to follow. You can say that's four or five, <laughs> but okay, number four. Then five, you're going to also seek out from these same people, not, we're not outsourcing, from these same people, capable individuals who fear God. Trustworthy ones. Okay. Uh, let's just see. So, and this is really interesting because the, the Mechilta Rabbi Ishmael says, you're going to seek out from among all these people. Moshe doesn't know all these people. And this is not just the 70 elders. This is beyond that. So Moshe doesn't know everybody individually, their counsel, their, their good character or bad character. He doesn't know. So, Mechilta um, of Rabbi Ishmael is saying, Yitro is telling him, use the, the spirit of holiness that you have, this Holy Spirit, to, to figure out who these people are. 
it's amazing. What a proclamation <laughs> that he is giving over, um, uh, Yitro is giving over Moshe. And uh, so men of ability, rich men who will not need to flatter or show favor. So you're going to find men who got have some money. They're not, so they can't be bought. You're going to find men of truth. These are people who command confidence. Uh, they're deserving that one should rely upon their word. Appoint these as judges because on account of their words will be listened to. And ones who hate lucre, money, like uh, men who hate or pay no regard to their property when it's to be made the matter of a lawsuit. Um, in accordance with what we say, any judge from whom one has to wring the money he owes only by means of a lawsuit is no fitting judge. So if you owe somebody money, but I have to take you to court to get my money back. You are not fit to be a judge. Okay. Somebody who's not, I don't want to be sued. Let me be, let me act accordingly. Let me pay him or her their money. I'm not interested in suing people and all this crazy stuff. That's who these people are. Should have money. They should be, uh, fear God, be trustworthy, not taking people to court. These, this is the men that um, Yitro is telling Moshe to find. And how amazing this is because it's like he knows the Torah already. I mean, if you know anything about the Torah and the Talmud, that is it, Bava, Bav, Bavra, Batra, Bavra, Kama. It's so many sections on how to disputes and things of that nature. And here Yitro is saying that. It's just amazing to me. Uh, please put it down below. I, I'm sure I said something something wrong uh, or not, you know, to make it clear. So, but <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting. Oh, uh, see, I want to read this, um, th this note, note. And you shall prophetically select from amongst the entire people men of wealth who are God-fearing, men of integrity who despise monetary gain, and appoint them over the people as officers of thousands, officers of hundreds, officers of 50, and officers of 10. You shall perceive, meaning with the prophetic spirit of holiness that is upon you. You have the spirit upon you. Use that to tell you who to pick. Now, there should be a long note in here. I hope it is. No, it's not. Okay. But it goes into detail about these thousands, 150. But this is the government that Yitro is advising Moshe to set up. To teach Torah, to teach the law and the understanding of how this new formed country, uh, nation is going to work under Hashem. That's how the king wants it. Verse 22, you're going to let them judge the people at all times. Have them bring every major dispute that they can't fix to you. Major dispute. And I'm sure there was some halakha or some uh, rules around how what a major dispute is versus a minor dispute but let them decide every minor dispute themselves make it easier for yourself by letting them share the burden with you oh beautiful 23 if you do this and god so commands you if god agrees with this you will be able to bear up and these all these people too will go home unwearied isn't that so true? Like, isn't it? Can't you, sometimes you're agitated if you don't if you don't get justice. So you see how in the beginning, right at Mount Sinai, still there, the idea of having a just nation is so important to uh, Hashem. And just from the recounting of the story of everything that happened to Moshe, as as he recounts that to Jethro. Jethro catches on to what kind of God this is and what kind of nation he is creating. That he can give this kind of advice to Moshe right in line with who God is and what he would want to see from his people. That's phenomenal to me. We're done with the second reading. Okay, on to the third reading. We're in Exodus 18, verse 24. Moses heeded his father-in-law and did just as he had said. Uh, I have to read this note here in the high unit. God told Moshe that Yisrael, y excuse me, God told Moshe that Yitro's plans was superior to Moshe's approach so moshe set up his proposed judicial system okay verse 25 moshe chose capable individuals 
out of all Israel and appointed them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, verse 26. And they judged the people at all times. The difficult matters they would bring to Moshe. All the minor matters they would decide themselves. And it looks like he followed what Yitro said to a T. And then verse 27, then Moshe bade his father-in-law farewell and he went his own way to his own land. And the sages say here, for the purpose of making, so the whole point was to make proselytes of the members of his family. So you, you say here, it's the sages saying that Mutro went back to his land so he can also teach um, his uh, family there the ways of the Jewish people because and become Jews as well, proselyte, because he himself accepted that. And I was that's what I was looking for, the note. Because uh, I was reading a note somewhere that when uh, Yitro was sitting there with all the elders and the Moshe and Aaron in front of in the presence of Hashem, it was because Yitro himself had accepted Hashem um, in all his statutes. And the same thing that he's talking to Moshe about that Moshe has to give to the people how to run in this nation. That Yitro accepted those things on himself. And um, so... That's that. And wow, that is the end of the third reading. Okay, the fourth reading, we start in Exodus 19, verse 1. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt, on that very day they entered the wilderness of Sinai. Having journeyed from Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Israel encamped there in front of the mountain. So please note, we just... The, the Torah uh, went a little bit out of chronological order so that it can present. Now we go back in time. It wanted to stay on the concept of Yitro and what's going on with him. So it, you get uh, Moshe comes out of Egypt. You don't hear anything about the golden calf, the receiving of the uh, what's Lukot, Lukot. Um, the tablets, you don't see, you don't hear anything of that. You just see him after everything's done talking to Yitro. Yitro gives the advice. Yitro himself proclaims Hashem as his God um, and wants to proclaim this God to his people, as we learn from the sages. That's the end of Yitro. So now that Yitro's full uh, chronological, under, what we needed to understand is done, we're going to go back and pick up. Because we're missing some details, right? So let's go see what we got here. Okay. Camped in the wilderness Israel and camped there in front of the mountain. So now, see, look at verse 2. Now, they entered the wilderness of Sinai. So it's just not a mountain. It's also a wilderness. And they camp in the wilderness. And then they go in front of the mountain. So now we're, we even get the verse that tells us that they camped in front of the mountain. Before, they were just at the mountain. <laughs> And Moshe and and Yitro goes to meet Moshe. So now you can see we've gone back, um, more so coming out from all that excitement that happened with Pharaoh and the fighting with Amalek. So they travel and boom, here we are. Now we're at the mountain. At the beginning of the third month, no less. And Moses went up to God, Hashem, called to him from the mountain, saying, "Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel." Wait, what? So we have, they get in front of the mountain and Moses went up to God. Hashem called to him from the mountain. Whatever that means, this is what you're going to say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel. Check this out. Uh, all his, for on the second, excuse me, Moses went up. This is saying on the second day of the month, Mechilta de Rabbi Yishmael, for all his ascents to the mountain, were made early in the morning as it is stated. And Moses rose up early in the morning and he went to Mount Sinai. Uh, let me see. Okay, so you see how it says here in the verse, thus, thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel. Check out this note. When it says to the house of Jacob, this denotes the women, the house of Jacob. To them shall you speak in a gentle language. See how it says, thus you, you shall say, to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel. So the house of Jacob say to the house of Jacob, this is a nice gentle language. 
And then when on the other side, when it says, and tell the children, literally the sons of Israel, explain to the men the punishments and the details of the commandments in words that are as that are hard and distasteful as wormwood. So um, you can speak to the women nice. <laughs> Just tell them. They'll get it the first time. But your nice, gentle language. But for the men, make sure you make it memorable. <laughs> All the details. Okay, uh, verse four. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings, wings and brought you to me. Now, this is what Moshe is saying. Now, I don't know if this is the nice version or the harsh version, but this is a version of what he's saying. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now then, verse five, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession amongst all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine. But you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. So that is what, uh, let's see, it says to the children of Israel. Maybe that's, uh, yeah, okay, These are. this is what you're going to say. And just to go back, let's see if we have a note. So the message is, if you obey me faithfully, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession amongst all people. Now, if you obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you'll be my treasured possession. Um, let me see. I know which I shall make with you regarding the observance of the Torah. Um, I have... Now, now, do not say that ye alone belong to me and that I have no other people together with besides you. And what else? Therefore, have I by which the special love I bear you can be made evident. This is not so. Um, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. And remember that word. We looked at it last time. It's, um, oops, I'm sorry. That's the kingdom part. There you can see it. Mamalechet. Mamalechet. Of Kohen. Kohenim. Not that everyone's a priest, but there's some kind of like officers or, or something. Every, because they're not Levites. So, as we know, this kingdom gets set up that way. So, there are more ministers. Um, or a parliament, <laughs> something like that. Okay, so I just wanted to to show that. And this in the hyena has, and you will be a kingdom of nobles and a holy nation for me. And these are the words that you shall say to the children of Israel: kingdom of nobles. So that's the end of the fourth reading. Fifth reading, Exodus nineteen, verse seven. Moses came and summoned the elders of the people, and put before them all that Hashem had commanded him. Check this out. Moses comes, he gets the elders of the people. Let's see if that's the 70 elders. Oopsies. Oops. Come on now. Rashi. Oh, there we go. Ibn Ezra. Um, so you have the elders of, it's not the whole nation of Israel. It's just the leadership that's intact. So he summons the elders of the people and he puts before them all that Hashem had commanded. And the note is, and this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel from Deuteronomy 4, 44. However, the Gaon says that the word set is used here in the same way as the word set in, in meaning set it in their mouths. Ooh. The reference is to the oral law, which explains the written law. And that's what we were talking about earlier. That's a good way to say it. Thank you, Ibn Ezra. So he made them to understand how the law works. He gives them the oral law, which explains the written law. All right. So, th but this is done to the elders of the people, not all millions of people with the cattle and the old people that can no. Verse eight, all those assembled answered as one. They answered as one saying, all that Hashem has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the people's word to Hashem. And you might say, why did he have to bring the word back to Hashem? Doesn't Hashem know everything? And no, the sages say, well, the sages said he he followed protocol. He did what was, he did that correctly. He didn't assume 
He just, he did the right protocol. And Hashem said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. Listen, I got to read it from this version. The Eternal said to Moshe, I'm going to come to you in the thickness of the cloud so that the people may hear when I speak to you and they will then believe also in you forever. I know that sounds like saying a lot, but forever. So then Moses reported the people's words to Hashem. The people's words were, all that Hashem has spoken, we will do. So Hashem went back up there and reported these words. And I'm in, what are we, we, where are we at? We're in verse 10. And Hashem said to Moshe, go to the people and warn them to stay pure today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. See, they had laundry mats and everything back then. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Hashem will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. Well, I don't know why Hashem is talking in third person right there. But it's me be ready. It's meaning might be that no person among them should sleep during the night after the manner of the high priest on Yom Kippur, as Israel would hear God's voice in the morning. Oh, that would be interesting. Okay, so let them be ready for it on the third day. Hashem will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. Uh, this I didn't see the note here, but you got to hear this. For all the people to see in the sight of all the people. The note is, this teaches us that there was no blind person amongst them because they were all healed. So everybody could see. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, wow. They see the king coming down the mountain. Verse 12, you shall set bounds for the people around about saying, beware of going up the mountain or touching the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Without being touched by being either stoned. Okay, let me read that again. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death without being touched. So if you saw somebody trying to go up the mountain, you can't even touch them to put them to death. It has to be either by stone or a shot. What's that mean? Slingshot? What kind of shot? Shoot him through with arrows. Oh, wow. We. Okay, got my answer. Um, <clears throat> I know. Yeah, right. So you, if you, back in the day when you said you got shot, that meant you got shot by arrows, not a gun. Huh. Okay. Um, so... Now, we know you cannot go up the mountain, and if you do, you have to be put to death, but you have to be put to death in a way that you can't touch that person being stoned or shot by arrow. Now, this applies to beast or person. A trespasser shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then they may go up the mountain. And why do we need the ram's horn? We need a ram's horn. Let's see. Do we have it? No? No? Okay. Um, the ram's horn sounds a long note. It is a signal of the departure of the divine presence and the cessation of the divine voice. Wow. We got two things. The divine presence is gone. And I'm thinking that's a, that's the Shekhinah. If not, please put it in the notes. Uh, if that's not, or it's, maybe you can give us an understanding what the divine presence is. If it's not the Shekhinah or Shekhinah, um, and also the cessation of the divine voice. The voice stops. That cold voice, uh, which we were talking about with the plague where it, the thunder has the, it, the word voice. That voice is, once that's done, and once I, God, depart, they are allowed to descend. To, excuse me. Once I, God, depart, they are allowed to ascend the mountain. All right. Moses came down from the mountain to the people and warned the people to stay pure and they washed their clothes. And pure, I believe, means you also abstain from sexual relations. And the people are the men. So this is the, what the men have to do. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. The men among you should not go near a woman. Oh, it's explained there. 15, verse 15, excuse me. On verse 16, the third day, as morning dawned, 
there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain and a very loud blast of the horn and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Wow. Um, meaning louder than the voice of any shofar that they have ever heard. And because of the shofar sound, they trembled. Can you imagine hearing something so loud? Just make you, whoa, and you just keep shaking. Moses led the people out of the camp toward God and they took their places at the foot of the mountain. Okay. Meaning Moses brought forth the people out of their tents to meet God and accept the Lord who came down on Mount Sinai as their God. Okay. There's some more good notes there. I please check them out, safaria.org and donate to Safaria. They're do making this public domain. Thank you. Thank you for making the sages notes known to us. Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was all in smoke for Hashem had, came, had come down upon it in fire. Oh, I can't even. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke for Hashem had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like a smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled violently. Verse 19, the blare of the horn grew louder and louder. And as Moses spoke, God answered him in Thunder, but coal, you see the word there? Wow, there it is, coal. That's how he answered with this loud, wow, we. Come on, Rashi. It waxed louder and louder. The manner of an ordinary person is that the longer he continues to blow a trumpet, the sound he produces becomes weaker and fainter. Right, because you run out of air. But in this instance, it went on getting stronger. And why was it thus, that, uh, that is not so loud at first? It was to make their ears receptive to as much as they were able to hear. Rabbi Ishmael, thank you. When Moses was speaking and proclaiming the commandments to Israel, for they heard from the Almighty's mouth only the commandments, and Nochi, and La Adon, La Yeye, La, while the others were promulg uh, promulgated by Moses, then the Holy One, blessed be he, assisted him by giving him strength so that his voice might be powerful and so become audible. Wow, Hashem made it. That Moshe's voice goes all the way wherever it needs to go. Wow. He answered, he that answereth Baash, Baesh, Baesh, in the fire, in respect to the fire, by causing the fire to descend. So here God answered Moses' petition that his voice might become audible to the vast concourse of people. Am I missing something? Did 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 Moshe ask for his voice to become loud? I don't know. Can you help me out? Can you put something out down in the comments or something? Cause I I don't really understand where that's coming from. That is the end of the fifth reading. Man, this is getting so good. Okay, this is the sixth reading. <clears throat> first, uh, excuse me, Exodus 19, verse 20. Hashem came down Mount, upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And Hashem called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. I just want to know what's going on with the repetition. One might think then that he actually came down upon it. Therefore, it states in Exodus 20, 19, Ye have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. These two texts together teach us that he bent down the upper and lower heavens and spread them out over the top of the mountain like a bedspread over a bed and the throne of glory descended upon it. Oh, it's too much for me. Okay, Mokilta. Uh, verse 21. Hashem said to Moses, go down, warn the people not to break through to Hashem to gaze, lest many of them perish. Wow. So Moshe goes up the mountain. Hashem gives Moshe, another command to go back down for the people's protection and tell them, don't break through to look. Gaze. You'll, you'll, you'll die. Verse 22, the priests also who come near Hashem must stay pure, lest Hashem break out against them. Break out. What? So these priests are the firstborn sons also through whom the sacrificial service was carried out. Okay, so um, Zebachim 115b. This is, um, so at this time, the firstborn sons of all of Israel were the priests, not just the Kohen. Everybody was serving as a priest at this time. Uh, everybody that's firstborn. All right, those who, who may draw nine to 
the Lord offers sacrifice to let them upon the right. Uh, okay, this is what we want. We want the verse four to break out. The word peretz is of the same root and the meaning as peretza, peretza, a breach. The sense is he may slay some of them and thus cause a breach in their ranks. Okay, yeah. I, I'm, mm. Verse 23, but Moses said to Hashem, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you warned us saying, set bounds about the mountain and sanctify it. So Hashem said to him, go down and come back together with Aaron, but let not the priests or the people break through to come up to Hashem, lest God break out against them. I just, Hashem is so loving that he just, no, no, just going to do it. I ask you to do it, going to do it. And Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. Now we're in chapter 20. Still we're in the same reading. God spoke all these words saying. So here we get the words. Okay, let's see. If you ever heard the commandments called the Devarim, here is that word. The utterances, the words. Um, okay. I just wanted to show you if you if you ever heard that before the Devarim, meaning the commandments. And remember, let's see if we get a note on this. I'm, I'm hoping we get a note. I just wanted uh, to see if there was a note on Devarim because we're gonna get the commandments. And for us in Western uh, traditions, we understand the Ten Commandments. We think that there's just Ten Commandments, but there's six hundred and thirteen commandments and uh statutes and all these different types of um things that Hashem wants the people to do it's just that and that Rav Rashid taught us that the 10 Devarim are the categories with which they fit into so there's that's why thou shalt not kill okay well what does that mean like how what is what does it pertain to and you get the other statutes under that. And then you have, along with that, you have the oral Torah that tells you exactly what that means. Okay, does it mean in this situation? Or well, what if I'm being, um, uh, somebody's fighting me on the street or da 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 So the oral law comes in and fills in the gaps of understanding to know how to walk out the all those commandments. So I was looking for that note that says that, but I'm sure it's here somewhere. I'm just missing it. Verse two, this is how he starts. I, Hashem, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods besides me. And verse four, you shall not make for yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of what is in the heavens above or the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, your God, Hashem, am an impassioned God, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generations of those who reject me. Note, please. <clears throat> he is jealous to exact punishment and does, zealous, I believe the word may be. He is zealous to exact punishment and does not pass over his rights by pardoning idolatry. Wherever the expression "cana" occurs, it signifies old French and potemon. English zeal. Like, I'm going to make sure this justice happens. Um, I was, yeah, I was trying to see the part that went about of them that hate me. Um, <clears throat> this must be explained in the same sense of, as the Targum takes it. When they retain in their hands, following the example of the evil doings of their ancestors. This comes from the Mishnah Sanhedrin 27b. And he keeps or stores up the mercy which a person does to give a reward for to the thousands of generations that a person's descendants. It follows, therefore, that the measure of good reward is greater than the measure of punishment in the proportion of one to five hundred. For the former is threatened only to four generations, whilst the latter is bestowed upon thousands, two thousands at least. And that's from the Tesefta Sota 4.1. You can see Rashi on Exodus 34 uh, verse 7. That's a great comment there. Ah, uh, we should have read the verse six because that's how they got the math. But showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
verse 7, you shall not swear falsely by the name of your God, Hashem, for Hashem will not clear one who swears falsely by God's name. I know some of that, and sometimes we get that one a little twisted, meaning in vain, for no valid reason, idly. Why is Shavuot show? I'm not sure what that means. An oath taken for no valid reason. If one takes an oath declaring something, the nature of which is evident to be different from what it is, for example, swearing about a stone pillar, that it is of gold, that's a problem. That's idly. So you shall not swear falsely by the name of Hashem. So if I understand this example right from Shavuot uh, 29a, it's saying, if you say, I swear by the holy name of Hashem that this wooden desk is wood, that's okay. But if you say, I swear by the holy name of Hashem that this wooden desk is gold, then you have sworn falsely, and that is what this is saying. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for your, excuse me, the seventh day is a Sabbath of your God, Hashem. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle, or the stranger who is within your settlements. For in six days Hashem made heaven and earth, and sea, and all that is in them, and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore Hashem blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother that you may long endure on the land that your God Hashem is assigning to you. You shall not murder. Verse 13, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And let's look at that one real quick. That's one. Okay. Uh, adultery. Um, you should not steal. This is, um, it speaks about, let's say, here it's speaking about a case of one who steals human beings. While the command in Leviticus 19, 11, you should not steal, speaks about the case of one who steals money or another person's property in general or perhaps this is not so but speaks about the case of <clears throat> one who money and the other about the case of the one who steals human beings um you must and however admit that the rule applies a statement must be explained from its context so how is it in regard to thou shalt not murder thou shalt not commit adultery each speaks of a matter for which one becomes liable to death by sentence of the court similarly Thou shalt not steal must speak of a matter for which one becomes liable to death by sentence of the court. And this is not so in the case of theft of money, but it is so in that of kidnapping. So you get that from the Sanhedrin 86a in the Mishnah and the Mechil to the Rabbi Yishmael. So you shall not steal is not talking about money. It is talking about you should not steal people. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or any ma or excuse me or male or female slave or ox or ass or anything that is your neighbor's. And that is the end of the sixth reading. Okay, the seventh reading. We're in Exodus twenty verse fifteen. I and I encourage you. Please go back and read the notes for this because this is huge. Most of the world goes by these commandments. Their, their judicial systems are built on these laws. So why not go and study them a little bit more? Thank you, Hashem, for giving these laws to the world. And thank you, Jewish people, for being diligent in carrying them out and make sure that we understand what they mean. Verse 15, all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the blare of the horn, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they fell back and stood at a distance. Okay, I just want to see what that's on. <laughs> uh, okay, we got the blind person comment uh, there. Um, the sounds which issued from the mouth of the Almighty. They stood afar out. They moved back, startled, 12 miles. Listen, they did not use the metric system. Looks, looks here like they used the imperial system. They moved back 12 miles, a distance equal to the length of their camp. And the ministering angels came and assisted them to bring them back. And the angels of the God of hosts made them move on. Move on. <laughs> Verse 16. You speak to us, they said to Moshe. And we'll be okay. We, excuse me. <laughs> we'll be okay. And we will obey. 
But let not God speak to us lest we die. Moses answered the people, be not afraid, for God has come only in order to test you and in order that the fear of God may be ever with you so that you do not go astray. Wow, I love that logic. It signifies an altar in order to exalt you in the world that you may obtain a great name amongst the nations because he has revealed himself to you in his glory. Through the fact that you see that he is feared and dreaded, you will know that there is none beside him and you will therefore fear him and not sin. That his fear may be before your faces. Mm. This is on purpose as a setup. It's to make y'all remember who you're dealing with here. Who is your king? Verse 18. So the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Hashem said to Moses, Thus shall you say to the Israelites, You yourselves saw that I spoke to you from the very heavens. No, please. Rashi, what we got? Okay, thus, thus shalt thou say, and in this the holy language. So you're going to say this in Hebrew. Ye have seen, y'all saw. This. There's a difference between what a person himself sees and what others relate to him. For what others relate to him, sometimes his heart is divided in its opinion, so he doesn't believe. This is saying, so all the other times Moshe's relaying, you know how I remember Moshe would, Hashem would tell Moshe to say something, Moshe would go to the people, the people would say something, he would tell Hashem, no, 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 no. This one, they had to see it, feel it, shake from it. Okay. This is what I have spoken to you from heaven. But another verse states, the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, and thus the two verses appear to be contradictory. Uh-oh, we got a fight going on. Excuse me, I'm not focused. There now comes a third verse and harmonizes them. Deuteronomy verse 436 says, Out of heaven he made thee hear his voice, that he might instruct you. And upon the earth he showed you his great fire. His glory was in the heavens, but his fire and his power were on the earth. Wow. Another explanation. He bent down the heavens and the heavens and the heavens and spread them out on the mountain. Similarly, it states, he bowed the heavens. Excuse me. He bowed the heavens and came down. Uh, Verse 20. You yourself saw that I spoke to you from the very heavens with me. Therefore, you shall not make any gods of silver, nor shall you make for yourselves any gods of gold. Make for me an altar of earth and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your sacrifices of well-being, your sheep and your oxen. And in every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. Okay, um, I just, his name, like, everywhere I, in all places where I mention my name, this means where I will give you permission to mention my proper name. I will come to you and I will bless you. I will make my shechina rest upon you. And from this, you may learn that he did not give any permission to mention or to pronounce his proper name, except in the place where the shechina would come. And this is the chosen house. Another term for the temple at Jerusalem. So Hashem gave permission to the priest to pronounce his proper name there while lifting up their hands to bless the people. Wow, thank you. That was a great note. Verse 22, and if you make for me an altar of stones, do not build of hewn stones for by wielding, wielding your tool upon them, you have profaned them. What? Okay, uh, let's see here. Thou shalt not build it out of hewn stones. Yes. For as a matter of fact, it is obligatory upon thee to build an altar of stone. And was, as it was said in Deuteronomy 27, 6, of whole stones, whole, shall thou build the altar of the Lord thy God. Similarly, Exodus 22, 24, uh, is oblig- obligatory and signifies when thou lendest my people money and if, and not if thou lendest, because it is said, and thou shalt surely lend him. Uh, refers to the meal off Omer, Omer, which is obligatory. Oh, I don't see. I hmm. This has the meaning of cutting the stones being thus called because the one hews them and cuts them with an iron tool. Ah, here it goes. Then you have profaned it. Okay, so we're getting a new one for by wielding your tool upon them, you have profaned them. Thus, you may learn that if thou lifts up thy iron tool above it and Thou profanes it. You profane it. 
The reason of this is because the altar is created. Its purpose is to lengthen men's days. And iron has been created. One of its purposes is to shorten man's days. It is not right that an object which shortens man's life should be lifted up above that which lengthens it. And a further reason is because the altar makes peace between Israel and their father in heaven. And therefore, there should not come upon it anything that cuts and destroys. Now, the following statement follows logically of fortiori. Um, you might know this as a cow for Homer, a light versus a uh, heavy, I believe. Um, so this is how a fortiori goes, a fortiori argument. How is it in the case of stones which cannot see, nor hear, nor speak, because that they promote peace, scripture ordains, thou shalt not lift up against them any iron tool. Then in the case of one who makes peace between a man and his wife, between family and family, between a man and his fellow, how much more certain is it that punishment will not come upon him? Okay. Um... I didn't really get that for you. Usually they're more clear. Put something in the comments uh, to help out, please. <laughs> Verse 23. Do not ascend my altar by steps that your nakedness may not be exposed upon it. Help on that. When thou builds, buildest an ascent to the altar, thou shalt not construct it of steps. Echelons in old French. But it shall be even. That is, the surface shall be unbroken and sloping. That sounds like a ramp. That your nakedness be not uncovered. Let's see what the rabbis say about that. Because on account of these steps, you will have to take large paces and so spread your legs. Now, although this would not be an actual uncovering of one's nakedness, because usually the parts are kept covered, since it is written in Exodus 28, 42, and thou shalt make for them the priest's linen breeches to cover the flesh of their nakedness, Still, the taking of large paces is near enough to uncover one's nakedness that it may be described as such. And you would then be treating them, the stones of the altar, in a manner that implies disrespect. Now, the following statement applies logically a fortier. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm not reading another. <laughs> yeah, let's read it. How is it in the case of stones which have no sense or feeling to be particular about any disrespect shown to them? So... How? They're not alive. How, how can you even... What do they care? Scripture ordains that since they serve some useful purpose, that you should not treat them in a manner that implies disrespect. Then in the case of your fellow man who is made in the image of your creator and who is particular about any disrespect shown to him, how much more certain is it that you should not treat him disrespectfully? So if you don't disrespect uh, a man made in the image of your creator... How much more one that's in this use of, um, if you don't disrespect the stones that are you made and made for this holy temple or holy altar, if you don't even disrespect the stones, how much more should you not even disrespect a person that's made in the image of man? Okay, that for Teori I got, that Kava Homer. Whew. Again, if it's not right, put something in the comments and help us out. Okay, look, that's the last of our reading for verse uh, for uh, our seventh reading and the last of the reading for the readings for the Torah Parsha Yitro. So stay tuned. We're going to do the Haftarah. Okay, the Haftarah portion is a bit chopped up, but um, it'll be fine. It's Isaiah chapter six, one through seven, excuse me, Isaiah chapter six. All the way through chapter 7, verse 6. And also chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. And let's see how it mates up to the Parsha of Yitro. In the year that King Uzziah died, I beheld my sovereign seated on a high and lofty throne. Oh, started already good. Sound like Mount Sinai, don't it? And the skirts of God's robes, robe filled the temple. Seraphs stood in attendance, each with six wings, two covering the face two covering the body and two to fly with and one would call to the other holy 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 god of hosts whose presence fills all the earth the doorpost would shake at the sound of one who called and the house kept filling with smoke i cried woe is me i'm lost for i'm a man of impure lips and i live among a people of impure lips yet my own eyes have beheld the sovereign god of hosts wow then one of the seraphs who had taken a live coal from the altar with a pair of tongs flew over to me. 
touched it to my lips and declared, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt shall depart and your sins be purged away. Then I heard the voice of my sovereign saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. And God said, go say to that people, hear indeed, but do not understand. See indeed, but do not grasp. Dull that people's mind, stop its ears and seal its eyes, lest the seeing with its eyes and hearing with its ears, it will also grasp with its mind and repent and save itself. And I asked, how long, my sovereign? And God replied, till towns lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people and the ground lies waste and desolate. For God will banish the population and desert, deserted sites are many in the midst of the land. But while a tenth part yet remains in it, it shall repent. It shall be ravaged like the terebinth and the oak of which stumps are left, even which they are felled. A stump shall be a holy seed. In the reign of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judea, king of King Rezin of Aram, and King Pekah, son of Ramaliah of Israel, marched upon Jerusalem to attack it, attack it, but they were not able to attack it. Verse 2 in chapter 7. Now, when it was reported to the house of David that Aram had allied himself with Ephraim, their hearts and the hearts of their people trembled as trees of the forest sway before a wind. But God said to Isaiah, go out with your son Shair Yashub to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road of the fuller's field. And say to him, be firm and be calm. Do not be afraid and do not lose heart on account of those two smoking stubs of firebrands, on account of the raging of Rezin and his Arameans and the Arameans and the sons of Ramalia, because the Arameans with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia have plotted against you, saying, We will march against Judah and invade and conquer it, and we will set up as king in it the son of Tabil. Okay, and also we're going to finish off Parsha with chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given us, and authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God, is plan in grace, the eternal father, a peaceable ruler, in token of abundant authority and of peace without limit upon David's throne and kingdom that it may be firmly established in justice and in equity. Now and ever, evermore, the zeal of God of hosts shall bring this to pass. Amen, amen. And that is the end of the Haftarah portion. And thank you again for studying with me. Please leave your comments down below. If we get some rabbis to uh, give us more insight or if you're a teacher of the word of the scripture, not just any teacher, have some credentials or something if you call yourself a teacher um but um to add to our end to our need to understand better but thank you again for studying with me um let's make this community grow that we can all study together you should not study Torah alone we study together and we study under rabbi using rabbi rashi rabbi ibn ezra and rabbi um ishmael um the mechilta from rabbi ishmael so please have a Shavuot Tov, a Shabbat Shalom, and a Shavuot Tov after that. And I'll see you again for the next Torah Parsha.